Welcome to this edition of In-Depth Alaska. I'm Chief Meteorologist Melissa Fry, and we are on Volcano Watch. We have been watching Mount Spur, the volcano sitting just over 70 miles west of Anchorage, which has been showing unrest for nearly a year. But just in the past week, new information showing that this volcano is likely to erupt uh, in the following weeks and months. We're going to check in with geophysicists with USGS and Alaska Volcano Observatory, Dave Schneider. I'm glad to be here. So we have been following this volcano really it's been almost a year since you started to let us know that there was some activity, some unrest going on with the volcano. Uh, really started to ramp up at last fall and then of course in February we got new updates uh, that there was a 50-50 chance that this was going to erupt. Now today new information after flights uh, yesterday and last week revealed new gas emissions I understand coming from the volcano. Uh, can you just give us a quick update? What has have you learned really in the past 24 hours to week uh, that is changing your understanding of what's happening under the volcano? Yeah, over the um, last Friday and then uh, again yesterday, we conducted airborne gas flights out at Mount Spur. And this consists of going out there and flying under the gas plume and through it to measure different um, gas species, um, different kinds of gases that are coming out. And from that information, um, we were able to, uh, first of all, notice an uh, increase in gas emissions um, from the volcano, as well as new pathways um, for gas emissions coming from the Crater Peak vent of Mount Spur, which is the site of the, the historical eruptions in 1953 and 1992. Okay, let's just go back a little bit to explain how Spur is unique because I understand actually there's two places that it can erupt from, uh, the place that we have seen before and where you're seeing some activity now at the crater. But can you also talk about the summit uh, possible explosion area and what's the difference between the two? Yeah, that's a great question and, it, and it's a source of you know some confusion. If you look across the inlet from, um, from Anchorage, you'll see that the high point out there is the summit of Mount Spur. Um, and that is a site where um, we haven't seen any deposits from an eruption from up there for more than 5,000 years. That's not to say that there haven't been, um, uh, hasn't been any explosive activity from up there. Um, it's possible that the deposits from previous, you know, from eruptions, you know, um, during that time period were too thin to be preserved in a place we can see. Um, but that's, that's the summit area. And then down on the flank, uh, maybe about 3,500 feet lower and, and to the south, there's the Crater Peak vent, which um, it has been the site of, of you know, all of the eruptive activity really over the last 5,000 years, including the historic eruptions in 1953 and 1992, as I mentioned. What's interesting is that the summit of Mount Spur is connected to the, to the is also part of the system because we've seen increased heat flow um, from the summit, um, and that's been noticeable both um, by melting of the snow and ice up in the summit crater, as well as steam emissions that people have can see from from Anchorage, um, especially when it's backlit, they're they're a little easier to see. So, um, so there really are these two centers, um, and you know, there there there's an interesting interplay. It's kind of a unique volcano in that sense, um, in terms of impacts to people from an eruption it really probably doesn't matter to the general public if it were to be spur or crater peak um and and you know just knowing that they're both they're both connected in in the system and that they're both degassing um at this point so um you know we feel that um you know we've moved towards a, a place where an eruption is more likely and our our, our language was in the next weeks to months um that doesn't mean that, that it would occur, and we really can't say at this point whether or not it be um, from the summit or from the flank vent. Okay, thank you. That helps uh, to just to distinguish how unique this volcano is and sort of how those two work together. Um, now, you say weeks to months for a possible eruption from Spur, but I also understand that you are expecting some more indicators before that happens. Are you fairly confident that we'll get some additional warning before we start to see ash coming out of the volcano? Well, you know, that's, you know, that's the basis of volcano monitoring. And, and so we base that on, on previous activity at Mount Spur. In 1992, there were, you know, weeks uh, of different kinds of activity that were, that were going on. So we certainly expect to see that um, prior to eruptive activity. And that would allow us, you know, hopefully to, to shorten that time window 
and give the public um, you know more more chance to to prepare. I should say that right now, even at the observatory, we're still in the preparedness stage. You know, we are reaching out to local emergency managers, state emergency managers, lots of different sectors to make sure that all of our response plans are coordinated, that our information sources are consistent and clear, and um, you know, really trying to make sure that the community can be prepared. And and so that that's kind of where we're at right now. We're not in the staying up all at you know, not we're not all staying up, you know, all hours of the night looking. You know, there are people that do look at the data, of course, we have alarms, but we're still in that preparedness footing here at the observatory. Okay, so you're suggesting that now time is the time for people to prepare uh, both for themselves or emergency kits. Why do we mm. need to prepare? What is it that's going to come from this volcano that we should prepare for? If it yeah, that, that's happen? a great that, that's a great question. You know, here in Alaska, we're, we're we have all kinds of natural hazards, as people are familiar with. You know, we have earthquakes. You know, we have big windstorms that knock out power for long periods of time. Um, there's always a tsunami threat for, for coastal communities. Um, et cetera, or wildfires. So really volcanoes are kind of fit in that same sort of infrequent hazard um, with a few you know, additional things like um, you know, having, having dust masks if there were to be ash fall. I should, I should, I should back up and just say the most, uh, most likely hazard and really that would reach anyone in populated areas would be from volcanic ash. Um, from ash fall, which is tiny little bits of rock, not like fireplace ash, but actual rock and glass that comes out of the volcano, as well as disruption to transportation by an airborne cloud. So in terms of preparedness for ash fall, um, there's, a great, there's some great resources on, on the state um, um, website, as well as AVO. We have a lot of ash fall impacts um, and, and mitigation information there. Um, but things like a, a mask, um, uh, masks are good. And of course, we all have masks now um, uh, from, from the pandemic days. Same kind of mask, a N95 type mask is recommended. Um, things like plastic sheeting to cover um, either sensitive equipment that you might have or just facilitate um, uh, cleanup afterwards, you know, where, or things that you, you don't want to have to deal with um, in terms of cleanup. Um, and, and those are kind of like the main things, in addition to those regular things that people should have for disruption to, um, you know, infrastructure, you know, or, or you know, from, a, from any other, you know, hazard that we face. Okay, great. Now, there are some people that were here, of course, in 1992 when we saw an eruption from Spur, mm. uh, but even more recently in 2009 when Redoubt erupted. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about the differences maybe between or similarities mm. between a Redoubt eruption, what we saw in 2009 uh, versus what we saw in 92? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So, um, you know, both of those eruptions had you know impacts on aviation. So, so the location and the difference really there really isn't isn't a huge there really isn't a huge difference for in terms of you know maybe air traffic in and out of, of Anchorage and across the North Pacific. Um, in terms of ash fall, um, you know, one of the differences is that Spur is a little bit closer to the major population centers in the Matsu, the municipality of Anchorage. Um, the Kenai Peninsula Bureau is a little closer to Redoubt. So, so distance matters when it comes to ash fall. The closer you are, the, the more ash would um, be likely to fall. So, um, you know, in that sense, um, you know, the proximity um, to Mount Spur, you know, to, to, to larger numbers of people sort of uh, affects the impacts. Um, in terms of the amounts, in, in 2009, it was just a very, a very trace amount of ash. It fell mainly, on, as I recall, on the south side of town. Um, and, and there was a little bit of ash fall at the airport, but not a lot. In 1992 from Spur, we had about um, uh, a quarter, um, sorry, eighth of an inch of ash, about three millimeters of ash that fell, and it doesn't sound like much, but when it covers the whole area and it doesn't blow away, um, that, that's an issue. So again, proximity to the volcano matters. Um, and in that sense, um, you know, being closer to Spur, um, you know, makes it a little bit more impactful than say Redoubt. Okay. That said, as meteorologists, you all know that it's all depending on the wind direction. I was just going to ask. <laughs> yeah, yes. in, yeah, in 1992, there were three explosive eruptions. One went due north um, and, and really just over the Alaska range and really had very little impacts. Um, one went um, sort of over the, the Matsu Valley, didn't drop a lot of ash that time because of and wind speed and direction. And then, then there was one that came over Anchorage. And actually, for you know, for part of the day, you know, darkened the sky and, and made it seem like nighttime. 
So, um, so it really depends on wind speed and direction. Okay, that that's AVO, that day. Yeah, that, that absolutely matters. So one thing we're doing that we didn't have in 2009 is we now have a, a, an ASH model that we run at AVO. Um, it's run twice per day on, on at sort of like you know midnight and, and 12 um, in, in UTC, universe, you know, different, different time zone, but that doesn't matter to people, twice a day yeah. for a given plume height. And, and that an ASH fall prediction from that model is on the AVO website. You can scroll down the Mount Spur activity page and that gives people an idea of places that could be impacted from a three hour eruption that went so high. Um, during an actual eruption, what we will do is to update that model with the observations of the start time and the altitude. And that data will be on our website. And most importantly, it goes to the National Weather Service, the Anchorage, um, the National Weather Service um, Anchorage um, Forecast Office. And they will use that model guidance to put out their products on, you know, for ashfall um, warnings on the community. Gotcha. That's such a great resource. And just to reiterate, it's a model for today, not necessarily when the volcano erupts, right? So uh, it, it, yeah. when that were to happen, that model will be important in those hours. Exactly. Um, you know, again, it's just to give you a heads up. We're also working on another product that we hope to get out soon that, that, that will be for like today, tomorrow, and the next day on a range, like a three-day product that looks at just a range of start times and cloud altitudes. And that'll give you not an amount of, of predi a prediction of the amount, but areas that have a greater probability of having ash fall. This is really for emergency managers, you know, facility managers, even, you know, airline dispatch, just have an idea of given the range of uncertainty of start time and height that, you know, this is an area that, that we'd expect there to be ash fall. Okay, Again, I could see that be being very useful. Yeah, the US, this is not a USGS, um, you know, we're not a warning agency. So this is just guidance. And, you know, as you know, in meteorology, models give you guidance that help you do forecasts. And so this is the same sort of thing. It's, it's the best math we can do, um, you know, but it has a lot of limitations in terms of things that we can observe that would make the math better. Um, it, it, they're just so, they're, they're important parameters, like how, how fine grained it is. And, you know, the, it, lots, lots of other atmospheric issues that if you could put into the model, you can do the math, but you may not, you don't really know what, what numbers to put in there. So it's the right. best math we can do right now. Gotcha. Okay. Now you guys have enough information now to know that an eruption is more likely than not, uh, more likely similar to 1992 in weeks and months is what I'm hearing. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you know and not know in terms of how much lava, how much ash could be mm -hmm. produced, how long of an eruption could happen? Is that, is there still a lot of question marks or do you kind of know what's in there? Yeah. So that, that's, a, yeah. So the, the exact timing, duration, and, and sort of magnitude of eruptions, that's, we can't forecast that. We know magma has come in. Um, you can do a model that predicts how much has, has come in, but you don't know of what has come in, if that's enough to make it to the surface, or whether or not, you know, how much of that will actually be erupted. Typically in eruptions, the amount of magma that comes into a volcano is, not, is, is what's well, usually, it's always less than what comes out. So, um, you know, that sort of magnitude and duration thing, that's not something we can forecast. There's just nothing in sort of observable that, that we could measure um, here. And that's pretty much, it's not just us. That's just, that's just the, the state of volcanology. There, there are some places in the world like Iceland where they can do a little bit better job there because it's a different kind of, of eruption um, style. But, you know, here we're, we're, we really can't forecast the magnitude. What we can do is to look at past eruptions, and that's really the basis of a lot of volcanology in terms of what we'd expect. We look at eruption deposits from 1992 and, and, and prehistoric eruptions, but a lot of geologic work that's gone in at, at Mount Spur and all the volcanoes in Alaska, or many of the volcanoes in Alaska, to look at eruptive history, understand how explosive they are, understand how much comes out usually, and that really forms the basis for um, our, our um, you know, the, the information that we that we can give out. Uh, so again, that's why we're, we're, we're sort of keyed in on sort of historical eruptions and, and, and thinking that the current one would be like an analog to those previous ones. Okay, gotcha. So looking for history to repeat itself. So yeah. if someone is hearing this information and going, okay, there's a volcano in our backyard that at some point could erupt, uh, what do you want them to know? 
you know, again, I think the main thing is like not panic. Um, you know, people have lived through ash falls before. I think um, so. So just realize that this is this is a, a problem that will come to pass. You know, if, if it comes to pass, it'll have a, a certain duration. And and to not panic. Um, there's a lot of really good information now that emergency managers have put together, um, and so really pointing towards authoritative sources of that information. We've done a lot on. Um, you know, bringing in, in concerns of like infrastructure and, and how, uh, um, you know, how, what are the impacts from, from eruptions as well as the health component. And so again, like the emergency managers for sort of like recommendations on what to do, um, you know, school districts, if, the, if there would be happen, if there would be eruption during the day to listen to, you know, school guidance and what their, um, their response plan would be, whether it'd be sheltering in place or if there was enough time for you know people to pick up their kids at school so really not panicking listening to emergency managers your school district your your, your, your municipality um, for that information and then looking to our partners at the national weather service for the for the products that they issue um you know that that'll give more information on on ash fall there's going to be a bunch of misinformation out there if if this were to happen or maybe not misinformation but you know um things that that they try to be, you know, exaggerate or hyperbole. So I think just just making sure that you tend to stick to sources of information from, you know, the AVO, Weather Service, and your emergency managers as as your sources of information. All right, great, thank you. And we uh, on our article on our website, we are going to keep that up as a blog style with any new information uh, until or should this uh, volcano erupt. We'll continue to provide information there uh, with the latest updates. And we've linked all of that information. I know emergency managers with AVO and USGS have put together a really great pamphlet uh, just explaining what ash is, what it can do, and how to protect yourself from it. Uh, so we have that available on our website, and we have information from the Red Cross uh, as well as our state emergency managers so you can continue to get uh, all of that latest information at alaskasnewsource.com and Dave I just want to thank you so much for joining us thank you for the work that you're doing there at the Alaska Volcano Observatory 24-7 operation monitoring these volcanoes and uh, keeping us updated